Madam Chairman, Madam, Madam Chairwoman, uh, today I'm pleased to present uh, Senate Bill 50, the proposed House Substitute 1. Uh, this bill clarifies abortion reporting requirements and requires abortion pill reversal information to be given at the time the abortive drugs are issued. Uh, I have with me today uh, two national experts who will share why they believe Senate Bill 50 is necessary and two Kentucky experts, one that has practiced OBGYN in Murray for over 40 years and has delivered 12,000 babies in his career and has real success stories related to the abortion pill reversal and a crisis pregnancy nurse that works with young ladies daily in crisis pregnancy situations. We have distilled our testimony to the most important parts today and should only last about 15 minutes. And I hope you find that our presentation to be educational. Would you like to adopt the committee sub? Yes, I would. Second. All those in favor of adopting the committee sub? Any opposed? All right, thank you. Very good. And I'll, I'll have each of them uh, introduce themselves and give their background as they give testimony to expedite things. Good morning. Uh, my name is Susan Liebel. I am the state director for the Susan B. Anthony List. Uh, we're the nation's largest pro-life organization and we house the Charlotte Lozier Institute, our research and education arm. And most recently, I spent 12 years as vice president of your neighboring state's uh, Right to Life, Indiana Right to Life, during a decade of pro -li prolific pro-life legislation, including legislation just like Senate Bill 50. Senate Bill 50 is a critical next, next step for Kentucky. Most states' policy didn't anticipate the expansion of technology and new uses of pharmaceuticals in the abortion industry. So most laws are focused on surgical abortions, but the growth of the abortion-inducing drugs is now fully one-third to one-half of all abortions. In some states, Planned Parenthood, Whole Women's Health, and other providers are actually applying for a license um, to just dispense the, the pills, the abortion-inducing drugs, a pill-only clinic, if you will. And in some states, they uh, use telemedicine to dispense the pills, which is kind of a danger because the FDA recommends an in-person examination to rule out ectopic pregnancy because the pills are contraindicated and could cause her harm. But the rise in pill-only clinics is only one means of the growth of the abortion-inducing drugs. A lawsuit filed in Hawaii by the ACLU was to make the drug regimen available by prescription in all pharmacies across the United States. And our Charlotte Lozier Institute has found 72 unique websites that have been identified to sell the drugs uh, online for an average of $167 per kit, but sometimes they say uh, bundle up, buy two, three, four, and save for use in your future pregnancies. Now, I digress a little because it's not legal for women to buy them online, but the policing of that is, is nearly impossible. So I say this to show you how widespread the use of the abortion-inducing drugs are, but there are a few problems which could spell disaster for women who take them. When the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved this abortion-inducing drug regimen, Mifeprex, Mifepristone, it did so by recognizing some of the risks involved and requiring a risk evaluation and management strategy, an REMS, like rules to follow when the drug is dispensed. And that REMS, required by the FDA, outlines a variety of requirements, such as only certain types of credentialed medical professionals can dispense them, the use of ultrasound to rule out ectopic pregnancy, both doctor and patient must, must sign agreements that they'll use them as intended according to the uh, manufacturer's views, and more because the FDA determined it was necessary to ensure the safety and efficacy of the drugs because sometimes they carry risk of life-threatening hemorrhage, infection, retained tissues, and sometimes need for further surgery to complete the abortion. Women report much more pain and bleeding than they were led to believe, and they sometimes suffer this alone. This seemingly easy process can be fraught with misrepresentation and a lack of data to understand how it's working or not working, and these aren't really the patients that are going to do a Yelp review of provider services. So from your standpoint, like the fear of Zika cases, knowing how many motorcycle accidents there are around your state, increases in, inf in uh, infant mortality. The state of Kentucky has a need to know how many of its young women are being given abortion-inducing drugs for statistical purposes, and certainly to know how often complications are seen. Medical research shows that, by default, 
the abortion pills have a four times more, can have four times more complications than the surgery, the typical abortion that we think of. So women are taking the pills at an alarming rate, but there's no public health monitoring of complications or negative after effects. So with Senate Bill 50, Kentucky would join 27 other states that require the original provider to report complications when they see them in their patients. One last thing, our Charlotte Lozier Institute published a study and ranked all 50 states um, in 2016 as to how they're reporting their statistical uh, and public, public vital records are done. And Kentucky ranked 43rd, and there were recommendations on how to upgrade your state reporting. And Senate Bill 50 takes an important step in that direction. We're working with Americans United for Life on the national level on a model reporting bill that states can use so we can track tens, trends and statistics nationwide. I'd be happy to tell you more about that model uh, reporting bill if you'd like. But Senate Bill 50 takes the right approach. It, it begins collecting data on how many abortions are dispensed through the drugs and how many complications are seen in the use of these potentially dangerous pills. The young women of Kentucky deserve your oversight on this largely secretive process that is growing health concern. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Dr. Donna Harrison, a board certified OBGYN and executive director of the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists, representing over 4,000 medical professionals who practice according to the Hippocratic Oath. And we urge you to consider and pass Senate Bill 50. The chemical abortion regimen consists of two drugs, Mifeprex and Cytotec or Mesoprostol. Mifeprex is the first of a class of drug called progesterone receptor modulators. Mifeprex works by blocking the effects of natural progesterone, uh, which is the pregnancy hormone which allows the mother to carry the baby. But Mifeprex by itself is only effective at killing a fetal human being about 75% of the time. So roughly one out of four women who take Mifeprex by itself without taking the second drug, we'll have a baby who will continue to live. But killing three out of four human beings in utero alone is not enough for Mifeprex by itself to be on the market as an abortion drug. So in order to make sure that a higher percent of unborn children die in the chemical abortion regimen, a second drug, Cytotec, is given two days after taking Mifeprex. This second drug, Cytotec, causes the womb to contract, forcing the fetus and the placental tissue out of the womb. Together, these drugs cause 95% of women who are seven weeks pregnant or less to complete the abortion. The way that Mifeprex works to kill the unborn child was clearly discovered during the development of the drug in the 1980s. Mifeprex blocks the action of natural progesterone, uh, the pregnancy hormone, by pushing that progesterone off of cellular receptors in a woman's body. Progesterone is what allows the woman's body to make the changes that, that can allow her to carry the pregnancy. By giving natural progesterone to a woman who has received Mifeprex, the natural progesterone can overcome the blockage produced by the Mifeprex. Experiments in animals during the development of Mifeprex clearly demonstrated that the abortions caused by Mifeprex could be reversed by giving natural progesterone. But natural progesterone must be administered within 72 hours of receiving Mifeprex in order to be effective. This concept of reversing the effects of a poison by preventing that poison from acting at the molecular level is well known in medicine. For example, the effects of heroin can be reversed by administering a drug called Narcan. Narcan reverses the heroin effects in the very same way that natural progesterone reverses the Mifeprex poisoning. Natural progesterone has been widely used for over 40 years to treat infertility and to help women in in vitro fertilization cycles to carry their pregnancies. Natural progesterone does not increase the risk of birth defects in children. Last year, a research paper reported over 250 women who continued their pregnancies to live birth after receiving Mifeprex, followed by natural progesterone. The survival rate of unborn human beings after being exposed to Mifeprex increases from 25% if they don't get the progesterone to 68% if they are given natural progesterone within 72 hours. There was no increased risk in birth defects. A network of abortion pill rescue physicians exists around the country so that women who change their mind after taking Mifeprex can be put in contact with a physician who will give natural progesterone to reverse the abortion. But the woman has to know about this option in order to call the network in time. That is why it is critically important that a woman be informed of all of her options, including abortion pill reversal, 
as part of a full co informed consent process before starting a chemical abortion. To deny women this information is to deny her full informed consent. I have also submitted a written testimony with more details, and the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists urges you to pass this bill. Thank you. Hi, thank you guys for having me. My name is Cynthia Nunn. I am the nurse manager for Marsha's Place Pregnancy Medical Clinic in Henderson, Kentucky. Um, it's an honor to be here today. There's so much talk, talk about abortion and I am actually the one that gets to sit right across from them and talk to the women that are actually seeking an abortion, have questions about abortion, are just in such a crisis moment. Um, it's quite an honor to be able to be in that position and speak to them. Um, I'm proud to say that we are one of two pregnancy medical clinics in the state of Kentucky that can offer the abortion pill um, reversal protocol through my OBGYN who oversees um, everything we, that we do at our center. So in that moment when they're in crisis, that is exactly when we get to intercept most of the time. And by that I mean just hear them out, see where they are in life, see what's happening with them, answer all their questions about abortion, about adoption, and about parenting. And if you've been a part of any of those three, none of them are easy. Parenting is not easy. Giving your baby up for adoption is certainly one of the hardest decisions to make. And as I said before, women, and they're so torn on what to do, it's not like they're making an easy decision. They don't come to me saying, I want to do this, and this is the easiest decision for me to make. So abortion pill reversal for me is a way to educate them to know the whole story as I you know I talk about ectopic pregnancy and miscarriage with them and it's a part for them to get the whole picture um, so that when they do walk out my door they are fully informed that they have all the education they need and that they're empowered to make the best decision for them thank you um, are there any questions but uh, I know in five women who had abortions. I call them when a bill like this comes up and ask them that they have no regrets. They don't. They knew why they were there. They saw that what was presented to them, and they knew that they could not and would not go through with that pregnancy. I've had right to life come before this committee and tell if I'd only saw the ultrasound, I wouldn't have done it. Two of those women had five abortions and I know they were showing an ultrasound at every instance that they had it. One lady said if she'd only seen it, she probably wouldn't have done it. She had two abortions, but ultrasound wasn't available at that time had not been invented. So her argument was not a good one. But the the thing about abortion, it's a very personal thing. I, now, I've got 13 kids between my wife and I, and uh, if I was for abortion, they'd done 13 kids ago, you know. That's not the point. You have to want these children. And I wanted all of mine. And my kids wanted all of theirs, and my grandkids wanted all of theirs, and they're taking care of them. But there's the ones that know they can't. I worked with a lady at GE. Her daughter got pregnant and she took her immediately to the abortion clinic to have an abortion. She says, one, you're too young to take care of it. She was 15. And she says, I know I'm not going to take care of it. And that girl, I check her all the time. She's had no regrets about it at all. So some of these things, you know, other countries don't seem to be having the same problem that we got because they teach sex education. They teach women, they provide birth control, they provide all the things. We probably have one of the highest rates of, of uh, not only abortions, but of illegitimate children and probably in the whole industrialized world. We've got to start somewhere, but it can't be infringing on one person's rights to make a decision. If, if she goes to a doctor and a doctor prescribes that, he tells her the consequences of, of that drug. Am I right, doctor? Am I right? Uh, I don't know exactly. If, if he don't tell them that he is negligent in his business, and I know he tells them, 
And, and you don't say one thing in this thing about the consequences of Viagra. And that's not different. It's all about birth control. So the consequences of Viagra is pretty serious, too. You should write that in. So is this a question you had for us? The question was a doctor who, who prescribes these day after pills and so forth does tell the patient what the consequences are. Is that not, well, that's my question. Representative Birch, many places in the country, abortionists <coughs> are informing patients that there is no way to reverse it if the patient changes her mind. So the purpose of this bill is to allow women to have full informed consent, which includes being informed that if they change their mind, and that's their choice, if they change their mind, there is a way to reverse this drug. But they need to know about that before they start the abortion because the time course is so quick. And that's why it's important that abortion providers be required to give this information to patients as well, part of full and full consent. Is, would the doctor tell them that? A good doctor? Say there, there are, you I can th reverse this if you want to. Wouldn't a doctor do that? Well, the problem is abortionists across the country are not telling women that this information is available. They're there not. are doctors who are not abortionists that provide this pill. Now, don't tell me there isn't. Now, there are. Well, this was from Planned Parenthood in Nashville, Tennessee, and they were informed, this, these patients were both informed, that it couldn't be reversed, number one, and number two, if it were attempted to have reversal, the babies would have birth defects. Well, what? Both of those statements are absolutely <coughs> false. We have a motion on the bill. Well, Second. the question on the bill. Second. I want to up, man, if I were. Well, if you can please limit it to a question, that would be helpful. Never mind, I'll just place um, we do have a few, uh, we have a motion and a second on the bill, but we do have a, a few um, other questions which I will allow Representative Bentley. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Um, I have a question. Is the physician the only one reporting this when it happens, according to the bill? Is there any other personnel involved in reporting the report of the use of the medication? The, the you're talking about the report of the reporting of the, the facility that the abortion occurs is responsible for reporting uh, the abortion, and that's 15 days after the end of the month. Uh, the, the, ex the extended and expanded reporting is really a clarifying measure to make sure that uh, it's clear that prescription or chemical abortions are considered an abortion and must be reported. And that's already in law then? In my opinion and several people's opinion it was very vague and that's what part of this bill clarifies that all chemical abortions must be reported. Thank you Senator. Thank you. Representative Wilner. Thank you Madam Chair. Um, <coughs> I was curious, um, there's a list of five specific drugs and then the much broader uh, any other drug or combination of drugs and I was just curious to know if these drugs are ever uh, prescribed for any other purpose other than um, abortion. Well, the RE486 is exclusively reserved for that process. The other drug, the second drug that's given is called misoprostol and it's commonly given for a number of different reasons. Uh, yeah. postpartum bleeding, sometimes that's used for that and a number of other reasons. It's also used for the induction of labor in term patients that have normal viable pregnancies at term. So it is a common drug that's used. But the other drug, misoprostol, mifeprax, RU486, is not used by any obstetrician. Yeah. Other. And, and additionally, if you look on uh, line 16, hmm. page 1, it says uh, it's it, it, when it's when they're prescribed, when the prescription is intended to induce an abortion. So that would be the doctor's call if they, uh, you know, prescribe uh, Pitocin or something like that for a, a general medical uh, situation, they would not have to report that. Thank you. A quick follow-up question. Um, I'm really in favor of women having all the information they need to be able to make informed decisions. Um, it's not entirely clear to me how creating this registry or this reporting structure would ensure. I mean, it seems like a medical ethics issue. 
So how does this solve the problem of women not having accurate, full information to be able to make informed decisions? The, I mean, the reporting, the reporting gives us statistical data that I think is important for our state in many, many reasons. The, the full information is the information that the RU486 two-pill process can be reversed if you only take the first <laughs> pill and not the second pill. That's what we are referring to as full information, fully disclosing all of their options, and that's what this bill, the committee substitute, is requiring that that information be given as well as other information about the drug so they leave the doctor's office or the clinic fully informed and know that if they regret the situation a day from now that there is a process, a phone number or a website that can be reached to, to reverse it. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you know how many of these reversals are done annually in the United States alone? Any idea? I, my understanding from looking at Dr. Delgado's testimony, which I think has been submitted to you, is that he has reported over 500 successful reversals. Wow. There are more attempted because not, not every time you give progesterone do you have a successful reversal. But the chances of survival go from 25% chance of survival to 68% chance of survival by administering the progesterone. So you could back calculate from the 500 successes how many uh, attempts there have been. I, I just want to thank you, Senator Mills, for bringing this piece of legislation. Uh, it's way overdue, and I hope that these ladies are very educated on their options in the future. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Representative Marzian. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is um, about case studies and research being done. And there is one in here from that Dr. Delgado, but are there any other uh, research across the country that you could point to that I could look at? Uh, Dr. Delgado published the first uh, short case series several years ago. I don't remember, probably four or five. And then his most recent case series was uh, published last year. That's the 2000, or, uh, 216 or so successful reversals. And I am aware of a continuation of that particular study on a nationwide level, but there isn't data from that yet. There's also Dr. Grossman that also published a case series in 2015, and his success rate was 66% if uh, progesterone was used shortly after taking the methotrex. <coughs> Representative Jenkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess this is to one of the uh, physicians. I'm just curious, given uh, the, the list of um, side effects and the recuperation from this type of termination, why do women pick a medication over a surgical? Or why do you think, I guess? Well, I think this has to do with the very purpose of this bill. I think that for the abortion provider, it is much more convenient to uh, give a pill, and if she has a complication, simply tell her to go to the emergency room so that they don't become aware of the complications, nor do they handle the complications. It's much simpler for the abortion provider, and so there's a lot of incentive for abortion providers to, to give pills instead of doing the surgery. The second thing is the information that the women are given about the pill, um, about the pill process, is often not accurate. Women can, can actually pass the tissue at any point for weeks. So she may be in the elevator or in the car when she's cramping. I mean, she's not going to pass it immediately when she takes the second pill. So women are not understanding this beforehand. And the reason I can say that, and, and Sue, you can back me up, is that um, we are aware of many, many, many stories from across the country of women saying, I was never told this is what the process is going to be like. So I think there's a real need for Senate Bill 50 because it, it requires more informed consent for the patient. And I would love to see a full informed consent be required uh, uh, for women to actually have to know exactly what 
the complications of abortion, uh, medical, chemical abortion, are before they have it. But that's not before the committee review. Okay, can I follow up, please? So you are testifying that you believe that folks, doctors that are providing this service are practicing that practice? What I believe is that the women's stories, that they were not told what to expect, I believe women. All right, thank you. We have some um, guests who have signed up to speak, Dr. Nolan and uh, Kate Wood. A couple things were addressed that I would like to bring up. Can you please up. introduce yourself for I'm, the record? I'm Dr. Nicole Nolan. Thank you. I'm a Kentucky physician. I've lived here most of my life, practiced medicine here, the whole time I've been practicing. Um, so uh, first of all, you ask if mifepristone is used for anything else besides abortion or as an abortion pill. And the answer actually is yes. There have been a lot of clinical studies looking at mifepristone for ectopic pregnancies, um, in addition to some um, spontaneous abortions, which are what the medical term for a miscarriage. So it is used in some other scenarios as well. In addition to the Cytotec, which is a very commonly used medication in OBGYN. It's one of the ones we use every single day. Um, I am all for patients who are adequately counseled. As a physician, it's one of the largest struggles in my life to try to get everything, which is so many years of training that I have in all of these medical procedures and medical problems, to try to condense all that information down for a patient is very difficult. There have been a lot of studies showing that patients don't have a good retention rate for uh, counseling information that you give them. I think a large study showed that patients remember on average about three things from every doctor's visit or hospital stay that they have. So I'm not surprised that a lot of women don't remember an extensive list of medication counseling, even after something like a medication abortion. Um, it is a process that can go on for a long time. Um, it can go on for a couple weeks. Uh, even if you're using the medicine to treat a spontaneous abortion, which again is a miscarriage, which again you can use mifepristone and Cytotec, which is misoprostol for, that can go on for a couple of weeks. And those patients should have follow-up. They should come back and be told that there's a chance you could keep bleeding. If you have excessive bleeding, you could come back and need a procedure called a DNC. Okay, and that's even not counting medical abortion as part of that therapy. As far as giving progesterone for reversal, my main concern is the concern of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. They put out a statement um, talking about medication abortion, and the statement from ACOG, which is the leading body of OBGYN, is that abortion reversal procedures are unproven and unethical. A lot of those case series were done without IRB approval, so that's the regulatory body that governs all medical studies done, even at our local institution up to the national level. Um, again, those case reports um, have not shown like, consistent evidence, I would say. A lot of them use different doses of mifepris or of progesterone to counteract mifepristone. Um, the study was not supervised, again, by an ethical committee or an IRB, and case series with no control groups are, again, one of the weakest forms of medical evidence, if you're familiar with the literature. Um, I think patients should be counseled appropriately. I would like all my patients to know all of their options for any medication that they take or any procedure they undergo, but I don't think physicians should be required to tell patients information that is medically inaccurate and that their medical governing body does not support. So if ACOG tells me that it's unethical to tell a patient that her medication can, or her medication abortion can be reversed with progesterone, then I don't want to go against those professional standards. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kate Miller. I'm the Advocacy Director for the ACLU of Kentucky. I apologize, we had not planned on testifying today. We were not prepared to testify given that Senate Bill 50 in its original form was dramatically different than what you have in front of you with the committee substitute today. Um, and with that in mind, we did not expect to testify on this piece of legislation. I apologize, you may have even heard an outburst when I heard about the committee sub, but as you all may know, I'm about 21 weeks pregnant myself, so I'd like to formally blame the hormones on that. <laughs> Thanks for the laughter. That was <laughs> not warranted. Um, so uh, just to be clear, this piece of legislation, uh, from our perspective, is unconstitutional. It will uh, be seriously considered for a challenge from my organization, the ACLU of Kentucky. We've seen similar legislation thrown out in other states. I'll um, provide the one example in Arizona when the law was challenged they could not come up 
with one legitimate <coughs> expert to defend the law in court and subsequently the state of Arizona actually came back to the legislature following the passage of similar legislation and repealed their law. So we would advise against passing this bill or perhaps given that you are just seeing the committee substitute today, I imagine, please just give it a little bit more time before moving on this piece of legislation, especially considering that you all do have a number of other bills restricting abortion that you're currently um, moving through the General Assembly. So we would just really urge you all, and we know this is an issue that is very important to all of you all, and, and certainly many of you do not agree with the ACLU, we want to respect where you all are coming from, but with something this serious, we ask just for you to provide a little bit more time for the consideration uh, before you and your colleagues. So uh, thank you so much. I think uh, Representative Goforth, you have a question? Yes, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Where in this committee sub, because I've read it since I've been sitting here, where does it say it restricts abortion? Our, oh, sorry, I was referencing other pieces of legislation. We're talking about this one, though. So the so new where, language, and you'll have where, to... Where does it say it restricts abortion? You'll have to excuse me, Representative Gopher, since we just saw it, but we believe that... How, how can you testify against something that you don't know what's in it? We believe that the new language... Um, that was considered today. Can, does anyone know the page number? The page four. Page four. Thank you. Will is intended to um, by providing education. Is intended to um, you, enforce women. It, it's restricting abortion, and you don't. You haven't read it. So how are you testifying against it? And there's nothing in there. I read completely through it while I've been sitting here. There's nothing in there that restricts. All it does is provide education. We believe that the best people to educate pregnant individuals on their Are physicians? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's what it says? Sir, I have to just acknowledge, I think okay. we probably... We're going to agree to disagree then because I've read the bill. You're <coughs> testifying against something that apparently you have not read because you, you couldn't identify any of your remarks in there. It does not restrict abortion. It's merely providing education. That's it. And That's it. And certainly, so we it, would that love may to save receive. a life. A, a life. It may save a life by providing that proper education. We There's been 60 plus million children murdered in if this saves one life, then I'm a yes vote. Okay. Thank you. Chair, may, may I respond? Quickly. Uh, so, of course, with any piece of legislation, it can be challenging to get the full understanding, and we would certainly appreciate in the future when you have a committee sub having the opportunity to review this type of language in advance of the hearing. It does make it very difficult to understand legislation, particularly when you have it just moments before commenting. But we believe that what is advised in this bill is inconsistent and um, undermines the ethical responsibilities of doctors and provides misleading and false information that can be dangerous for patients. Thank you. The Just um, FYI, the committee sub was sent out yesterday. Oh, I'm so sorry. To members. For, um, Representative Marzian. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a uh, question on the um, requested info to be given out uh, has had no clinical trials correct and um, case studies case studies on it sorry and would you consider this similar to the uh, false rumor that went around for years and may still be going around that an abortion causes breast cancer? There has been research done on the link between abortion and breast cancer, and that has found to be debunked. Um, I don't know what strength of evidence was used. I know that this series is a case series, which is, again, just giving a drug to patients. Um, the fact that it was done without regulatory body approval kind of concerns me. Anything that's done outside of accepted medical ethical procedure and then reported as fact in the news kind of concerns me as a physician. That's just not how we do things. 
Okay, we do have a motion and a second on the bill. Um, I thank you for your testimony. Thank, thank you, you very for much. the opportunity. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Secretary, if you could please take the roll. Representative Bentley? Yes. Representative Bojanowski? No. Representative Bowling? Yes. Representative Brown? No. Representative Birch? Madam Chairman, I'd like to explain my vote. I question my district every year on this issue. And it always comes back 80, 85% that the issue of abortion should be between the mother and the doctor and religion and politics should stay out of it. And that's why I feel comfortable that I can vote no on this bill. Representative Elliott? Aye. Representative Frazier? Yes. Representative Goforth? Yes. Representative Jenkins? Briefly explain my vote. Um, I think this is unnecessary and probably unconstitutional. And with an eye to our budget, every time we pass something unconstitutional and it goes to court, we end up paying. And I think our money could be better used <coughs> on the first bill we took up, which would supply monies and resources to uh, grandparents taking care of their own kids. Thank you. I vote no. Representative Marzian? Just very briefly, I explain my vote. I really believe that uh, a personal private medical decision needs to remain personal and private between the physician and the woman. We do way too much meddling with women's uteruses, and I vote no. Representative Lewis? Yes. Representative Gibbons Prunty? May I briefly, briefly explain my vote? As someone who comes from health care, uh, I believe that statistics are needed. I don't know why they are not, are not kept on abortion clinics any more than they are in other health facilities. And as someone who believes in fully informed consent, I, I vote yes. Representative Raleigh? Yes. Representative Brandon? I vote no. I'd like to explain why. Um, I heard the process of these uh, prescriptions being written described as a secretive process. Um, and I happen to have, it made me think of this, that's in my pocket, I have a tampon in my pocket. It's not in my pocket because my period is a secretive process, it's private. And I believe that any prescription written for me or anyone on this panel or anyone in this audience is private. I vote no. Representative Sheldon? Uh, I'd like to explain my vote, please. Uh, I would say that it, the thought that not even one uh, lady has changed their mind after they began to, to make this decision. It would be ridiculous for any of us to, to believe it not to be true. We've already heard testimony that hundreds of, uh, of, of reversals have taken place. So my position is real simple. It's uh, if we can save one baby's life, just one, with this bill, just by informing and giving more education. It's not taking anybody's choices away. It's just, it's, it's, it's here's more education. And if you can save one baby's life, uh, then this should be a yes. So that's why I'm a yes. Representative Tate? Yes, thank you. Representative Weber? Yes. Representative Wilder? No. Chairwoman Mosher? Yes. We do have a title of amendments to approve. An act relating to reporting on abortions. We need a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thanks. Senate Bill 50 passes with favorable expression and should do the same on the floor. Um, thank you all for your, your compelling testimony. Um, I believe it was very educational and I, I thank the sponsors for bringing this. Hi, I'm Richard Nelson with the Commonwealth Policy Center. You can find more of our videos on YouTube and Vimeo. And for more information about the Commonwealth Policy Center, go to our website, commonwealthpolicycenter.org.